Amen. Let's stand up and worship tonight. Praise the Lord for you being here. We uh getting a little late start, but we're just waiting on all that food to show up in the basement so y'all be good and hungry and and get what you need tonight. I'm thankful for you being here. We've uh, had a good night so far and we're just going to continue that. Brother Blaine's here. He's going to preach to us, give us the gospel of Jesus Christ, but before that, we're going to worship him. Amen. The beautiful thing about it is you're the hungry people. You're the ones who came tonight saying, hey, this is me. I want more. So that's what I'm going to pray right now as we um, lead in a word of prayer. I'm going to pray that God will give you exactly what you're looking for in this place tonight uh, to keep you and hold you and make you exactly what He wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, uh, bless this time of worship. May it be pleasing to you. May our lives and our songs be the same, God. May, may our worship be who we truly are what we truly are God nothing more and nothing less God let us tonight see your goodness your glory see how uh, you want to work God and, and just purpose ourselves through faith to see you move and to see you do great things God bless this time of worship God may everybody here connect with you be in tune with your Holy Spirit that we might hear from you through the worship and the word God speak to us and let us be drawn close in Jesus name we pray Amen. Let's worship together. Your name is all we need. 
Jesus are with thee. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Isn't the name of Jesus are with thee? He's the way, church. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Is in the name of Jesus, how we be. Give that name some praise this evening. You turn Ken up in our ears just a little bit. I like to hear him so well, I need a little bit more of him. <laughs> praise the Lord. I hope you're not a, a slave any longer to sin. I hope you've got that wrapped up. You know, in Jesus Christ, you're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. But I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. Let's sing that again. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins but I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer Church. Lord, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. One more time. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yeah. 
no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. ever be now let's do that one we praise the lord for being his children and we want to ever praise him i don't think we can praise him enough for the glorious things that he does for us for the way he empowers us and, and, and not being in fear being brave as miss tracy saying about this morning going out into the uh, the world that we live in and enjoying the life that god's given us and and really fighting off hell i, I just really want us to be a church that doesn't just uh, have a good time in this building but we actually engage the culture that we live in to Amen. do something great uh, for the glory of God here tonight I pray that you praise him more than anything I pray that you love him more than anything I pray that you want him more than anything and that in this place tonight your love and your passion can grow for him and as brother Blaine comes and speaks to us in just a little while that not only will the worship but the word will ignite you it will strengthen you and it will build you into what God would have you to be father in Jesus name let this time just be a time of us being uplifted in your spirit that we might leave here and go into the world tomorrow and be everything that you've called us to be May we always praise you. May we always long for you and seek you and find you in the, in the places where we don't even know that you exist in everything, God, because you're in the workplace, God. You're in our homes. You're in the, the places we've been and, and the places we are to go, God. You are already there preparing the way. So let us ever praise you. Let us ever love you. Let us ever get into your presence and be exactly what you've called us to be. Help us as we praise your name right now in Jesus name we pray amen
with angels and saints and we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints and we sing worthy are you lord and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints and we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints and we sing worthy are you lord and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips 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 father we praise you we worship you as king of kings and lord of lords let us forever praise you with our voices and with our lives god bless this time tonight in jesus name we pray amen shake hands with someone before you sit down as we get ready to hear mr blaine speak tonight god bless you and thank you for being here <laughs> Jesus, our Savior, I believe in God, our Father, I believe in Christ, the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. Try to, uh, I wasn't sure what Matt preached out of, and he told me he preached out of the NLT, and uh, so that's what we're going to use tonight. We're going to use Matthew's Bible, and I'm sure it's probably completely underlined from Genesis to, <laughs> you don't mark in it. Hey, brother, good, good. Hey, there you go. Hey, uh, you know what I was thinking? If I was a member of this community, this is probably the church I would go to. Because, uh, man, you guys seem to love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? I mean, you know, I, I uh, saw your sign outside, and it said something like, uh, Live the word, 
live the gospel, walk, the, speak the gospel, and then it had a B F T H F. Okay, I was wondering. I was like, buff, buff the f- gospel, buff the f- gospel. So I wasn't quite getting it, you know. So I thought it had to be, yeah, some kid or something. Yep. So that's normally what happens. But um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Blaine Deloach, so I'm the director of missions for the Carol Benton uh, Baptist Association. And um, I'm so glad that we've got churches like you all who are members of the Carol Benton Baptist Association because we need churches like you all. I mean, God has taken this church it seems like, and God has just exploded this church, and uh, we need that. We don't see that much anymore. We don't see older generations together with a younger generation, and that's what I see tonight. I see younger generations together with an older generation, and you're both praising God and loving God together, and that's what we need as an association. We need to show the association that it can happen. And it can happen in the same service. You don't have to have two different services, one for traditional and one for contemporary, this and that. Hey, you can get together and you can love God together in the same service and worshiping the same Savior, Jesus Christ. Because He brings us together, doesn't it? He doesn't divide us. He brings us together. And so we need churches like yours to be an example. And that's why I am so excited being here tonight. And I heard that I really missed out because I bet it was packed this morning. Was it packed? It usually is on Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, you know, everybody takes off. But that's understandable. You know, you got kids and you got to get them to bed and, you know, all that kind of stuff, that routine. But these are the, you know, they have, they've always called the Sunday nighters the faithful few, right? And uh, so we've got the faithful few with us tonight. And uh, we're just going to go through some scripture. Matthew, I've, I've fallen in love with your uh, pastor here. Well, not like the romantic type of love, falling in love, but uh, yeah, that's right. So I uh, just wanted to clarify that. But uh, no, this, this guy is pretty awesome, and um, we've had lunch together, we've talked together numerous times on the phone, uh, run uh, ideas by him already, and uh, so um, we're just going to have a great relationship, I think, he and I, and uh, put this on your calendar, for the ladies, it's going to be the first annual Women's Christmas Banquet. All right, it's going to be at First Baptist Church in Huntington. All the ladies, I don't know if you have a church van. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, get in a couple of different vehicles or as many ladies as that sign up. It's going to be $12 per person. You'll get a meal, everything else. We'll have it right there where they always do in their gymnasium. And then we'll move to the main sanctuary for a time of worship, which will be, you know, Christmas time. So we'll have some Christmas carols. We'll have a special music by someone. And then my wife is going to give her testimony of how her and her family escaped Cambodia. They lived through the Khmer Rouge. Uh, Many of you have heard of the Khmer Rouge. You've heard of the killing fields. From 1975 to 1979, The population of Cambodia in 1975, before the Khmer Rouge took over, was 7 million. In 1979, after they finished their reign of terror, there were only 4 million people left. So, uh, out of a population of 7 million, 3 million died of execution, starvation, and disease. And she lived through the entire four-year period. She was about six to seven years old when it started, and um, 
She uh, has an amazing testimony. Had never heard the name of Jesus until she lived in refugee camps for two years. When they escaped the country in 79, they lived until 81 in refugee camps in Thailand. They were sponsored to come to America. And in Memphis, Tennessee, where they were settled, they a church reached out to them, a church of retirees. And if you're a retiree, God's not done with you yet. God still wants to use you, and God will use you. And this group of retirees saw this influx of, and if you remember, if you were back, you know, around during the early 80s, you remember an influx of Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, all those people kind of came over to the U.S. during that time period. And so she came over. She was Cambodian. And so this group from this Southern Baptist Church, Highland Heights Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, located on Summer Avenue, if you know a little bit about Memphis, and they saw these Cambodians. They started reaching out to them, taking them to the doctor. They'd never been to the doctor before. Uh, many of them didn't know how to shop in grocery stores. They shopped in open markets where, you know, you would have your seller right there. She would have her vegetables and all of her fish and her goods right there in front of her. And uh, it was brand new for them to walk into a grocery store, and there's no seller there by the food. And they're like, wow, did we just take this stuff or what? And so uh, she, you know, it was just uh, something different about these Christians that she saw compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the ones in Memphis, they didn't really care for these Cambodians who just came into their city. They're taking our jobs. They're, you know, this and that. But then this group of Christians loved on them, took them to the doctor, showed them Christian love showed them they were the gospel to the Cambodians. And because of that, because they lived it out, when they spoke it, Saran and her family became to believe it. And uh, so, uh, guys, it's an incredible testimony. She's going to share her testimony uh, that night. And uh, she had a couple of sisters who died during the Khmer Rouge. Uh, she was responsible for taking care of. They sent men off to men labor camps, women off to women labor camps, left the kids behind to fend for themselves, digging up roots, she said, bugs, grasshoppers, whatever she could do to feed herself and her sister. Her sister, in about two years, 1977, uh, during that reign of communism, ended up passing away and uh, died of starvation. And uh, she would cry herself to sleep at night, just sorrow upon sorrow because of the loss of her little sister and no one to share the experience with. She didn't have her father or her mother around. And... Uh, and then finally, when uh, the Vietnamese came in and they conquered the Khmer Rouge, everybody scrambled to try to find their family members, and uh, they did. And uh, about eight months later, they decided to escape Cambodia, go into Thailand. That's when they were sponsored to come to Memphis. That's when they heard the gospel, and they became believers. Incredible testimony. That's going to happen December the 1st, so it's a Friday night, and that's going to be our first annual Women's Christmas Banquet. It's going to be an incredible banquet because we're going to have, you ladies are going to be taken care of. You're going to be fed well, all right? It's $12, so not much, and you're going to be served by your pastors. So you, you, Brother Matt is going to have himself a little apron on, and he's going to be walking around with little cups of water and pitchers of water and say, uh, um, you know, Miss, you, you sure did, brother. You sure did. Yep. 
and I did too by my wife, so she said, you're going to do this, and uh, so uh, we did something similar to this uh, in our association, actually just in my, my church. I came from Hawaii, so just to let you guys know that real quick, but um, uh, so you say, well, my goodness, coming from Hawaii to West Tennessee, why would anybody want to do that you got some screws loose dude what's up with that <laughs> and uh so um yeah i got a few screws screws loose but uh yeah you know after a while of 365 days a year of 70 to 80 degrees temperature and just you know preparing sermons and reading books under a palm tree with the book in one hand and glass of lemonade in the other, and waves lapping around your feet, and, you know, sand, nice soft sand to walk on, and the sand between your toes, you just get tired of all that stuff after a while, you know it, and uh, yeah, so um, we just felt like, well, God was leading us, actually we did, uh, I, I was raised in Jackson, Tennessee, and uh, so we just, we felt like God was leading us back, and my mother is, is getting up there in age and my uh my in-laws are still in memphis uh both sharon's mother this is pretty incredible her mother and her father survived the khmer rouge which is unusual because it, most most people lost both of the parents or at least one of their parents um they killed any former military and her father happened to be former military so he had to burn every document that related him to the military at all. And he had to ingrain within the children, if anybody asks you what your father does for a living, you need to tell them, I'm a farmer. I'm a peasant farmer. That's all I know, and that's all I do. And I've never been educated in my life because they hated people who had been educated. They went into cities. They killed people with glasses uh, because they thought that if you wore glasses, that meant you were educated. And uh, so normally I, w I wear glasses, so I'd be just as dead as you would if you wear glasses. And uh, so it was just a terrible, terrible time. And again, it's an incredible testimony for all the ladies. You're going to have to be there. If nothing else... For the reason of seeing Pastor Matt in an apron, all right? So, and hearing a good testimony about Jesus. So, uh, what's that? Hey, hey, there you go. There you go. Well, I'm sure he'll look real cute in an apron, don't you? Well, let's see, Matthew, uh, or Matthew, my goodness, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's where we're going to be uh, today, and uh, Pastor Matt, did you get my uh, email on the outline? You going to have it up there in just a second? All right, good deal, because I actually forgot my notes tonight, man, so I'm going to be looking at the outline myself, and, uh, but... Uh, Oh, well, yeah, it always does. It's not a problem. Uh, but I'll remember it because I, I've preached this one before, and uh, it's such a great message from the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Man, thank you, brother. Awesome. He's got it printed out for me right here. Super. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 18 through uh, 21. And uh, this is just a great passage on salvation. In fact, um, Matthew made a, Pastor Matthew made a uh, comment on um, us being new creations in Christ or new creatures in Christ uh, during the, the song time. I'm not sure if you remember when he used that particular phrase, but um, how many of you can say that you are a new creature in Christ? How many of you can say that? All right, most of us. 
Now, how many of you can remember being an old creature and what you used to be like before you came to Jesus? All right? So a lot of people. So let me ask you a question. When you came to know Jesus, did Jesus radically change your life? He should have. All right? He should have radically changed your life. In the sense that, well, maybe you weren't a drug addict before and you didn't see a dramatic change, but he changed you into being a very selfish person into now wanting to be a very unselfish person. A very impatient person before, but now you're wanting to practice a little more patience towards your wife, towards your spouse, towards your kin towards your friends. He's changed lives, and that's what Jesus is in the business of. He's in the business of changing lives. And spiritually, we're going to look at some things tonight. We are way off spiritually compared to what we really think. And we're going to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Here we go. And all of this is a gift from God. And he's talking about the things concerning salvation. The fact that we've been made new creatures in Christ. We've become a new person. Uh, Verse 17 says the old life is gone. A new life has begun. And then verse 18, he says all of this is a gift from God. In other words, you can't take credit for it, and I can't take credit for it, for being a new person, because it all comes from God anyway. God's the one who makes the difference. God's the one who does this. All this is from God, who brought us back to Himself through Christ, and the world to Himself. No, uh, let's see. Uh, Brought us back to Himself through Christ, And then I skipped a portion, it says, And God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ and listen to what Paul says. He speaks for for Christ and he also pleads with people, come back to God. That's how important the gospel was to Paul. That he pled with people. Get your life right with God. Because if you don't, the Bible says, after death comes judgment. You will stand before a holy God. And if you stand before a holy God without being clothed in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ, you will stand there naked before Him as a sinner and receive His just condemnation. And you can't, because God offers you something so much more. God offers you forgiveness. And then my favorite verse of Scripture, right here in verse 21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, Right, He was not a criminal. He didn't die for his own crimes. But he became an offering for our sin. In other words, he died for our crimes so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Man, that's a great little passage of Scripture, isn't it? Let's unpack it real quickly, okay? 
Let me give you, first of all, our first point, the plan of reconciliation. All right? The plan of reconciliation. If you've got a little scratch piece of paper to jot something down, get these points, all right? The name of the uh, message is God's plan for man. And this is his plan. He wants to reconcile you to himself. And you say, well, what's wrong between me and God? Because I kind of like God. He's not that bad. He really hadn't been that bad to me. Sure, I was raised in a pretty rough household. But you know, when it comes to God, He's been pretty fair to me. He's been pretty good. Well, the truth is, if you're a sinner... Bible says you're at war with God. Not because of anything He's done, but because of what you've done. But because of what I've done. We're at war with God, according to the Bible. We are, as Paul says in Romans, at enmity with God. We're fighting with God because of our sin. Because we won't give up our sin. We are at war with God. And we kind of like it that way. We kind of enjoy, if you remember that old life of sin we were talking about, we kind of enjoyed it back then, didn't we? Especially those of us who came from maybe a party type of background. We couldn't wait for the weekends. We couldn't wait for work week to be over, and then on the weekends, man, we were going to get a keg and just hang out in the woods somewhere and just smoke and drink and just do whatever, and it was going to be a good old time. I'll tell you, during that time, you were at war with the very one who made you, and you were at war with the one who had the best plan in mind for you. He had the best for you, and you didn't even know it. What does reconciliation mean? Reconciliation means the bringing together of two parties who oppose each other and making them friends. That's what it means. When I talk about me and Pastor uh, Matthew, we got in a little squabble. We didn't really. Let's just, we're making something up here. But we got in a little squabble, and I got him so mad he wanted to punch me one day. And then somebody came in and intervened and said, you know, you, you, you two guys are both pretty good-looking fellas. And, you know, yeah, you, you, Pastor Blaine, you'd kind of be dumb to get in a tussle with Pastor Matthew because... Um, you know, he's a little bit bigger than you, and, you know, he's got them big cowboy boots. He could just step on your feet real good and hurt you. Might break a toe or two. And uh, so i thinking to myself, well, he's probably right. So what I need to do is I need to reconcile with Pastor, jo uh, Pastor Matthew. Did I call him Josh earlier? Not yet. Okay. Because we got another brand new. A uh, young pastor in the convention. He's at First Baptist Huntington. And uh, that's kind of what I was telling you earlier. If I lived this far out, this is where I'd come to church. Because I, I loved the worship. It was awesome. And I've, I've loved your pastor and seen how real he is and all that. And uh, But unfortunately, you know, Carroll County, uh, Huntington, I got to be close to work, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm stuck way out there. Plus, I like to hunt and fish. And uh, Crispin, where'd you go? Crispin, he's, he skipped out, didn't he? That's what I thought. Yeah, because I don't see him around at all. He's gone, man. Oh, that sucker. Next week, you can talk to him. You can say, hey, yeah, yeah, I mean... He pretty much did his job and just took off, didn't he? Well, what do you think about Christians like that? I don't know. You know I tell you, won't stick around for the word. Yeah, he's here when needed, but uh, 
He's not listening to the word of God, man. That's what we want to do. No, uh, uh, grateful for his service. But uh, anyway, so you guys just kind of needle him a little bit next week. I, yeah. <laughs> I hear you, brother. So, uh, so anyway, um, let's say he, he, you know, somebody like him steps in between me and Matthew and they help to reconcile us uh, to one another. In other words, they're the ones who steps in and makes former enemies into friends. And that's what reconciliation is all about. It's those who were at war with one another finally come to a place of peace and harmony. And instead of hating one another, begin to love one another. And that's what the Christian life is all about. And that's why church folk don't need to ever have any problems with one another because we serve the same Savior. We're living for the same Savior. We've got the same goal in mind, don't we? To spread the fame of the Savior. To spread His great name. So why would we be at odds with each other when we've got the same goal in mind, when we've got the same plan and vision in mind to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus, a world who so desperately needs Him, why would we fight with each other to get that out? Let's don't do that. Man, let's reach the world with Jesus and make sure they're reconciled to God. And here, I want to give you a sub-point. And it was popped up there for just a moment. Here's the sub-point. In eternity past, God graciously chose to seek and save sinful man. All right? That's incredible to me. In eternity past, when did God come up with this plan to reconcile man to God in eternity past. He planned it all way back yonder in eternity past. Because Peter in his first sermon in Acts chapter 2, when he stood up and everybody was speaking in tongues, all the Christians were, and they were hearing the gospel in their own language, languages, and they couldn't believe this miracle that was taking place, Peter said this so that they could all understand it. He said it in Hebrew, and he said to all of them that this Jesus whom you crucified, God had it planned from all eternity. In other words, It wasn't a mistake that happened when Jesus died. Jesus willingly gave Himself voluntarily for you and for me. And it was a plan that God had from the very beginning. Jesus came to seek and to save. And you remember Him saying that, right? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. And do you know what a ransom is? We need to kind of get familiar with some of these Bible words because these Bible words are important. What a ransom is, is it's a price that's paid to buy a slave which was every single a slave out of sin and give him his freedom. And so Jesus did that. He was our ransom. He was our price that was paid to God so that we could be removed from our slavery to sin. So in eternity past, God chose that that would happen. And I put there, God graciously chose. Because guess what? God didn't have to do anything. 
When we sin through our federal head in the garden, Adam and Eve, and they took of the bite of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when they did that, we did that. And when we did that, we were basically turning our backs upon God and spitting in God's face and saying to God, God, we don't need you anymore. And in fact, God, get out of my life. I can be my own God. I can make my own decisions. Let me do what I want to do. I want to be the king of my own life turned our backs on God and spit in God's face. Well, being fair, God could have done the same thing. God could have said, hey, that's the way you want it. That's fine. I'll just turn my back upon you as well, and I'll walk away. But did God do that? God didn't do that. Graciously came up with a plan to reconcile man and woman back to himself. And he didn't have to do it. He could have left us in our sin. He could have left us in our chains. He could have left us headed straight to hell and not even known it. But instead, out of His grace, He chose to save us from our sin, our slavery, and ourselves. He's a good God. He's a real good God. All right, let's go to the second point here. The people called to the ministry of reconciliation. All right, did you catch that? The people called to the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, Look at the last part of verse 18, where it says, and God has given us, we're involved, as believers in Jesus, we have a certain task, a certain duty, and what is that? We have a task of reconciling people to Him. Remember that uh, illustration I just used where, um, you know, somebody, me and Matt were having a little tussle and we couldn't get along with each other and we needed somebody to step in and to, you know, reconcile us back to one another. And it, it, it was crisping in that, out, but uh, it, w- it was Crispin in that example, but um, he, uh, uh, he stepped in and said, guys, you know, we really are on the same page. There's no need for us to be arguing with each other. We want the same thing. We want to see Jesus' name lifted high, and he helped us reconcile. Well, guess who's been given the ministry of reconciliation between man and God? All of us. We've been given the gospel. And guess what the gospel does? When a person comes to faith and trust and belief in Jesus Christ, they are involved in the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in showing people how they can be reconciled to their creator, to the one who made them. Because when they were born in this world, they were born separated from God. They were born apart from God. And they need to be brought back to God. And the ones who carry that message of how they can be reconciled to God is you and me. Those of us who know the gospel message, those of us who know that Jesus died upon a cross as our substitute, 
Jesus rose from the dead three days later. He was placed in a tomb. And he rose from the dead three days later. And through faith and trust and belief in Jesus Christ, not by your religious works, not by how good of a person you are, that's the only way you can be saved. That's the only way you can be reconciled to Him. You go out on the street and you ask most people, hey, where do you think you're going to go? Most people are going to tell you, well, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, how do you know you're going to go to heaven? Because I've been a pretty good person. You know, my, my good works kind of outweigh my bad works. You know, I've never killed anybody. I've never really stolen anything. All that. Well, guys, in the eyes of God, we're not good. Because God doesn't look at just external actions, but He also looks at the internal affairs of the heart. And I don't know about you, but when He looks at my heart sometimes, He sees a bunch of ugliness and a bunch of darkness. How about you? I mean, there are thoughts that go through my mind, thoughts of, Man, he shouldn't have got that raise. I should have. He shouldn't have got that promotion. I should have. Thoughts of jealousy. Thoughts of pride. Thoughts of selfishness. Man, those are just as ugly in the eyes of God as any of the external crimes that you can commit against Him. And so we all need to be reconciled to God. And we're the ones who hold the key to that. And the key is the gospel of Jesus. That is a treasured possession God has placed in our hands to go out and to be able to share that good news with a lost world who's headed to hell to tell them how they can no longer be headed to hell, but be shot driven to heaven and living in eternity with Jesus Christ. I mean, there's no greater news in the world. And in fact, in verse 20, it says that we are Christ ambassadors as if God is making his appeal through us. And we speak for Christ when we plead. And, and this is how Paul was. And that's the amazing thing. And that's why I like Paul so much. And that's why he's my hero. Because he pleads with people, come back to God. You remember in Romans 1.17? Do you remember what it says, or is it one, Romans 1, 16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the salvation to everyone who believes. Let me ask you guys a question. Why are we so ashamed of the gospel? Why? When it's the best news a person could ever hear. Why are we so ashamed of it? Why do we come to church and sing of the glory of Jesus on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, and then on Monday mornings we keep our mouths shut at work? We keep our mouths shut around our friends. We'll listen to their coarse jokes, but man, when it comes to standing up for Jesus and telling somebody about Jesus, we'll keep our mouth and our lips tight. Why is that? Paul wasn't that way. He says, I plead with people, come to know Jesus. Embrace the gospel. Embrace the message of reconciliation. Because that's the only way you can be right with God. God has given every believer the privilege of proclaiming that rebellious man 
can be made right with a holy God. You see, that's why we're separated from God. Because He's holy and we're not. And because of that, we're at war with Him. But we can be made right through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is good news. Let me give you the final point, and then I'm going to be quiet, and we can all praise God, hallelujah, and head out. The one who provides reconciliation. So we got the plan of reconciliation, the people called to the ministry of reconciliation, and now the one who provides reconciliation. And I told you, this is my favorite verse in the Bible. Because this tells you of the one who provided reconciliation for you. And it tells you of how good he is and why he shouldn't have ever been the one to die for you. Paul says, for God made Christ, who never sinned. And that's why he should have never died for you, because he never sinned. He never did what you did. But he made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God. Man, Jesus died a death he didn't deserve to die. Jesus suffered punishment that he didn't deserve to suffer. Jesus took the pain that he didn't deserve to take. He died a death that was meant for you and me. I mean, how good is that? How good is Jesus Christ? The King of kings and the Lord of lords stepped off of His throne in heaven he had been eternally connected forever to the Father. Their fellowship had forever been perfect and sweet. And he stepped down off his throne. And for a moment on Calvary, when all of the sin of the world was placed upon his back, do you remember what Jesus cried out? Do you remember? He did cry out, it is finished. When it had all been said and done, when the work of salvation was all over. But before that, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you say, well, why did God forsake Jesus? It was simply because of love. Because the weight of the sin of the entire world was so heavy upon the shoulders of someone so righteous like the person of Jesus Christ that the holy and perfect Father could no longer bear to look upon His Son. And you talk about the pain of the cross and remember Jesus praying, Lord, if there be any other way, then let this cup pass from me. It wasn't the physical pain that Jesus was worried about, but it was that momentary separation that he knew he was going to have to go through when he had eternally fellowship with the Father. For eternity they had had perfect fellowship, but he knew he would go through a short time period when that eternal fellowship with the Father would be broken. And we can't understand how painful that must have been for Jesus. But it was so painful that he cried out in his prayer, 
Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But if not, let your will, what? Be done. Amen. So Jesus was willing to do whatever the Father asked Him to do. That's the one. He's the one who provides reconciliation. Talk about grace. Talk about mercy. Talk about one who loves you more than you could ever imagine. Talk about one who loves a lost and dying world more than they could ever imagine. You've heard this before. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And the last verse, listen to this. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. Man, you talk about the depth of God's grace and it goes deeper than even your greatest sin. You can't out sin God. And that's good news, God. Because all of us in this room tonight are greater sinners than we can ever imagine. We can't see how black our hearts really are. But marvelous, infinite, and matchless is the grace of God. And the one who provides reconciliation is the one who stood in your place and my place and died on the cross for us. Let's look at the last um, sub point. And it says this, The Lord Jesus is our penal substitute for sin, taking our place and dying our death. Do you see what he did? He took whose place? Say it with me. Our place. And he died whose death? Our death. He was our penal substitute. 
That was God's plan to reconcile the world to himself from the very beginning was to provide a substitute for us. One who would say, God, they don't have to die. I know their crimes are great. Their crimes are mighty. Their crimes are high. But I'll die in their place. I'll be their substitute. And when it says penal substitute, what that means is that he would be the substitute who would take our penalty. And what's the penalty for sin? The wages of sin is death. Eternal death. Sending you straight to hell unless you come to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Jesus, marvelous, matchless, infinite grace, will you this day His grace receive? Let's pray together. Father, thank You so much for how good You are. Lord Jesus, we give no one else the glory for our salvation but You. You alone deserve all the glory. Oh God, we came to You in faith and we were saved by grace through faith. But Lord, even the faith that we placed in You was a gift that came from You. So Lord, really from beginning to the end, salvation is something that You do. And Lord, You're so good because You were our substitute. You died our death. You took our place. You died for crimes that You didn't commit. Every single one of us on our lips tonight need to be the words, thank you, Lord Jesus, because we don't deserve what you've given us. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Thank you for being the penal substitute for our sin, taking our penalty upon your own back, taking our place, not committing any crimes yourself, for you were totally innocent, totally pure, totally perfect. You were a lamb without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, and yet you laid down your life for creatures as dirty as us. How good you are. And Lord, when you come into a life, you make a life brand new. And we're so glad we are not what we used to be. We may have thought we used to have a good time, but it was nothing like the lasting joy that comes with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you for being good to us. Lord, tonight, I thank you for this church. I thank you for their pastor. I thank you for his love for you, his excitement for you, and his desire to see people come to you. Lord, I pray he would be a man, and I pray that every single man in this building, not just him, You've called Him to preach the Word, but you've called every single one of us to be a minister of reconciliation. And that means pleading with people, come to God. Come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Make us your ambassadors who carry the gospel around the world. Let us be faithful, Lord. We love you, God. And 
Lord, in our hearts tonight, if there's something that's not right with you, before we leave this place, help us to get it right with you. We love you, God. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Just a few things to say. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Amen. Thankful for Brother Blaine? Amen. Thankful Crispin got busted? <laughs> and thankful for the food that's downstairs. Amen. So let's pray, and then we're going to go downstairs and enjoy some food together in a time of fellowship. Thank you again for preaching a pure gospel. I'm thankful for uh, a gospel not of works. Uh, not of uh, baptism, not of church membership, not of anything but the, the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ and faith in that shed blood, that burial, and that resurrection. And I'm thank that's a pure gospel, and I'm thankful that you preached that tonight. And that we all need to be reminded of that at all times. Let's stand up, be dismissed in a word of prayer, and then let's go downstairs and enjoy a time of fellowship together. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd bless Brother Blaine and his ministry here in the Carol Benton Baptist Association. I pray that everything he does will prosper, that it will be good for your kingdom and good for the churches, God. I pray that his work will bring great unity and many souls uh, to, into the kingdom, and, and many uh, people like us tonight will be encouraged to be ministers of reconciliation. God bless him and his wife, his children, and all that they do in their ministry here for us and the churches. God bless this time of fellowship and this food. May we always do your will. Thank you, God, for what you've done here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.